Hello and welcome to another episode of our Dolby Institute and Soundworks Collection podcast. We're doing conversations with all of the artists who are nominated for Sound Academy Awards this year. And I am thrilled to be talking with the team uh, behind Dunkirk. This is our final, the, the, the last of our five episodes that, we've, uh, that we're doing this year, talking with the Academy Award nominees. And I'm really glad that representing uh, the, the picture, uh, of course, uh, is nominated in both categories this year, sound editing and sound mixing. And I'm thrilled uh, that uh, uh, we have Gary Rizzo, uh, who makes the dialogue here. I'm sitting with Gary in person. Who's, and Gary's, Gary's an old friend of mine. We've known each other, I realized, today for about 20 years now. That's true. It's good to see you. It's good to see you, too. And uh, participating via Skype, we have um, nominated in the sound editing category, Alex Gibson. Hey, Alex. Hello. Uh, and in the sound mixing category, also on Skype, uh, we've got Greg Landecker, who mixed uh, uh, sound effects and music. And also uh, Mark Weingarten, who um, it was the production sound mixer on the show. Is that right? That's correct. Cool. And just uh, so this is going to be part one of the conversation around Dunkirk. Um, and then in part two, uh, because these guys are so darn busy, it was impossible to get everybody in one room at the same time. Uh, we're going to uh, uh, reprise a, an episode that we did last summer with Richard King in which he talks uh, at great length about Dunkirk. So stay tuned for that. So um, with the guys who are here, uh, congratulations. You guys just got a, a BAFTA last thank, weekend. Thank for you. Best thank sound. Thank you. That was a wonderful experience. Let's put it that way. It really it's was. Like really fun. That's a long way to go for an award show, isn't it? I, you know what? Yes, that uh, eleven hour flight. It was a long, <laughs> you know, a long three days. Yeah, no doubt. Alex, I thought that um, if you don't mind, I thought I would start with you because you're credited. You're credited on the film as the supervising music editor, um, and I. Um, th- there may be some people listening in who don't know exactly what a music editor does. So, can you give us the can you give us the lowdown on that? Uh, sure, uh, I'm responsible for anything that involves music. I have to handle the tracks, keep the tracks in sync, work with the composer. Anything that's music, I'm responsible for. So in Dunkirk, I'm presuming that there wasn't a lot of of source music in this. It was pretty much all, this was Hans Zimmer's score? Yes, no source. Um, and and I think that you know some people might naively think that the that the music comes out of Hans Zimmer's studio and just shows up on the stage and goes directly into Greg's faders and it's all great. But that's not the case. <laughs> no, that's not the case. It's pretty much the polar opposite. It comes to me, and uh, I manipulate it extensively with Chris, and we put out a new product. Yeah. And Alex, how how many how many uh, two track inputs uh, were you coming into your Pro Tools plus your five point ones? Uh, probably two hundred. There you go. 200 some odd soundtracks of music running all the time that I'm going to elaborate on Alex. He's being very generous here or, you know, not forthcoming. There was all of these two track elements, the percussion, the uh, synth tones, the orchestra, the strings, the brass. So over 200 of those tracks are feeding his Pro Tools and they were all linear throughout the whole thing. So he had to open up and create from these elements the track that you hear so uh, for alex it was an intense editing job because what would happen is that one picture cut in the movie one frame would throw the timing of alex's tracks completely off because it was timed out from the very opening to the very end of that movie so poor alex i mean he, he, he's under the gun on that i saw him at the end of it, all of a sudden, uh, Lee would come down and say, okay, we're going to have a picture cut here. And I could see uh, Alex's face go, oh, <laughs> there goes about six hours of my time at night, yeah. night after we wrap. <laughs> so anyways, I just wanted to elaborate. He's being very modest about what he went through. Well, I had, did have help. I had Brian Rubin, who yeah. really came through. Which has been your right-hand man for how long now? Uh, quite a while. I think since inception yeah yeah so i wanted to touch on that too you know you guys as, as a team have been working together for a while um and that is that seems to be 
uh, Chris Nolan's way when he when he when he gets with a team that he likes, he sticks with them. Um, how was Dunkirk different than the other movies that you guys have worked on with Chris? And I'll just I'll pitch that to the team and anybody who wants to run with it. I don't. I really don't think it was any different. I mean, the collaboration with this group uh, had. You know, we call Gary as uh, our father time because he's done the most movies with Nolan. I came on in Dark Knight Rises. Uh, Alex more. is probably even further back. I've than done that. More. I started on Insomnia the, earlier than Batman. But I mean, as far as we all understand Chris's mind, and it's it's not easy to put his soundtracks together, but it also is not out of the question of what we're trying to reach for in those soundtracks. So I, it's a great collaboration with me and everybody. Everybody works. You, you talk about a music and sound effects and a dialogue community working together which is very rare on films yeah usually it's a push pull type of thing uh it worked so cohesive on chris's films there's not that push pull ever the biggest difference i think with this one though and i think that the the crew will likely agree with me is that most all of this film different from the other one is really one huge music here and i think that's what alex and greg were alluding to earlier in that when it starts, we set the pace, we set the basically the, the heart rate for the audience as we start. Yeah, let's set the tone. So you're talking about that very first opening shot with, a, with yeah. the soldiers walking down the road. Yeah, and with it's, the paper flutter. The paper yeah. flutter, and then the music starts there. And is it, I mean, is it pretty much continuous through the entire... Yes. Until Finn falls asleep on the train. Really? Yeah, until the train until, and you hear the tick, the tick, 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 and it's there for, was it... 10, 30, maybe 30 seconds. Then it starts back up to that kid waking up on the pier. That's the only break in the entire movie. I want to, I, I'm, I'm curious about that. Cause you know, it, it seems that certainly, um, I mean, I, I, I've, I've certainly worked with a lot of younger directors who seem to have a little bit of an allergy to, to score, uh, to, a, to a certain degree. Um, but this is obviously a completely different experience. So you've got music. Why, why stylistically was music through the entire film, the right choice for Dunkirk? Boy, I, Alex, I, I, <laughs> that's a Chris question, but we, yeah. he, he, I mean, we had to maintain the urgency at at all times. This is like a weekend for, I mean, it was 40 minutes for the pilot. So we just had to right. keep the foot on the gas. Yeah, no Chris, letting, Chris, no he, letting off. You can't let off because then you just lose it. Yeah. Yeah, because if we tried pauses that the pauses would slow the film down and it was a very interesting effect that once you start taking the music out and lose that thread of that the heartbeat of the movie the the timeline of this movie it seemed to stall and it's like i can see where chris in his editing room with lee smith picture editing uh and his thought behind it is that you keep the pressure up on your audience because this is war this is this is not good it's there's good and bad parts, you know, as far as, you know, the, to it. But, I mean, as war is just oppressive. Mm -hmm. So he wanted the music for your audience was like, ah, when are you going to let up on me? And when they do, that's when you kind of take a breath. You do actually physically breathe differently within Chris's scores. Yeah. To some degree, um, you know, we've heard about the, uh, the, the use of the Shepard tone in films past. It's actually right. gained some popularity out there in... It's not a secret in, anymore. <laughs> yeah, in the in the YouTube world, um, where you feel like the frequencies are constantly rising and you're constantly being heightened, and it feels like there is no end that's to that the constantly. And so we used a, a a bit of a derivative of that, um, and it wasn't just the music, and it wasn't just the sound effects, and it wasn't just the dialogue. It really was the integration of all of it. And and the way that I've looked back at it is that every sound in this film as looking back at our mix, every sound, regardless of what it was and what department it came from, it had three, three considerations to it. It had a particular, um, a, the, the pulse, meaning it's amplitude. Mm -hmm. How loud are we going to use this particular element? And it had a pace. Every sound particularly had a momentum to it. How fast is this moving? Mm -hmm. it, does it increase in speed? Does it decrease in speed? What are we doing with the, the pace of it? And it also had a purpose. Chris is always kind of analyzing those three aspects of it to say, 
what is the meaning of this sound? Mm -hmm. How fast is it moving and how loud are we playing it? And collectively, he's kind of orchestrating exactly, um, well, hijacking the cardiovascular system of the audience. <laughs> he really is orchestrating that. He's conducting that. So the audience is responding exactly in the rhythm, the mm -hmm. pace, and the speed that he wants them to react. And it is cumulative between all the departments of sound. And that to me is one of the unique, the most unique aspects of this particular mix. Yeah, I get 100%. I, it, it, and it sounds like, you know, these are, these are techniques that Christopher Nolan has been experimenting with through the films, but it really feels like it's kind of come together on Dunkirk. What, because what I, hear, what I hear you saying is that everything in that track is very purposeful and it's all about taking the audience on this experience and keeping the tension. I mean, it's obviously, I think, you know, it's, uh, it's, uh, I, I also am aware that it's by far the shortest of Chris's movies as it well. It is. I think it's 88 minutes. I, I can't be certain of that, but it is, I think the script was something crazy, like 74 pages. Yeah. Which is, but you know, he, he, this, he, the constant rhythm thing was an idea that early on, early on, uh, he knew that we couldn't sustain that any much longer without driving the audience insane. Right. I mean, you can only take so much. Yeah. And it, and we experimented all through the dub as with different sounds, because if you, certain sounds you get tired of. So the fact that you didn't even think, you thought the music maybe had stopped. Well, you got to listen to the boat engines because they're playing it. Their engines are actually yeah. the rhythm or other things i mean it's very well, subtle i wanted but, to i wanted to ask you i wanted to ask you guys about that and and this may be a, a question for uh for greg primarily but one of the things if i'm noticing a trend in the the conversations that we're having with the oscar nominees this year um it's a it's a blurring of the the line between sound design and music um and i i feel like dunkirk is really kind of a prime example of why that's useful. So Greg, I just wanted to acknowledge, you know, you, you mixed sound effects and music on the film and that's unusual. So, um, can you talk a little bit about that, that process? And, uh, I, I think I did exactly, you know, what, what Alex was talking about, which is I presume some of those elements were sound design when maybe they were actually Hans's score. Yeah. Well, it's way Chris likes because what his feeling is, and it's, it's unusual that he wants the sonic tonality of the music to be in the same hands as the sonic balance of the sound effects. Because if it's in one person's hands, I can hear that there's a low EQ frequency in an aircraft that's messing up some of uh, our score within that, and it's harder to get the score through, so you start pushing the score. Well, it's easier for me to go over and start EQing that out, so you're not pushing, you're not doing a step ladder with, with the different elements. So it's a great way to work, and it was a wonderful way for me to work, uh, is that I had that tonality balance in my head. So I could adjust whether it be, I need it more out of the drums versus the guns, so I knew what frequencies to start hitting the, the music. So they did have a slight EQ change. So you understood that that's music, not sound effects. And it was a, it was a fine dance between that all the way through. So there was a lot of equalization between those two and the blend between it. Because I think in the traditional way where I would be doing sound effects on the movie and we'd have a music mixer separately, that that conveying of those ideas is a little harder to grasp because the music is always trying to, you know, hear every note. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, it's harder for me to understand what's in that score because it's not in my hands to sit there and say, oh, I can do this or I can do that. Now, it does work out in other films that way. I mean, obviously, 200 and six other films I've done that way or whatever, <laughs> but the idea that that's Chris and I really understand the value to operate with music and sound effects as one, because like Alex was talking about, he said, because we could lead this Moonstone in, which Alex had, and it was actually the sound of the boat motor that they had recreated within there. I'm not going to tell you the trick, of it, but we could feed that into prior scene so it was pre-lapped into the music so when you went into those scenes it was like oh wow okay this is a boat 
Yeah. Or this is an airplane or this is, you know, so it was a great balance, great working uh, relationship between the two departments. Yeah, I also think it comes down to a bit of a time and efficiency um, um, thought. For, for Chris's workflow, the way that we usually work is uh, when we are into the final, once we're beyond the temp process, the temp actually is part of, our, or it starts the final mix. But as we get into the bulk time, our six weeks of final mixing, what we typically do is that we work through the film between Monday morning and Thursday afternoon. And on Friday morning, we're screening the film. So in wow. a six-week final mix, we screen it six, six times. times. So we go so around the horn. So you a complete pass through the film every week. Yes, every week. Yeah. Wow. And so the nice thing about this workflow and the and the, the division of labor is that, yes, there's there are a lot of... Um, knee-jerk reactions that Greg will have instinctually that Chris clearly subscribes to and, and appreciates the style and, and the, the thought process behind it where, yes, he will grab that EQ in the music because he knows it's interfering with the guns. It happens very quickly. He doesn't even have to turn to somebody and say, what do you think if we fill in the blank? It just happens. And whereas you know that Chris loves to maximize his production track, is very, very little ADR. I could probably count the lines on one hand that are in the entire film, maybe this film and the last film on one hand. <laughs> um, but um, so I am hyper-focused into that material. And because we're working, you know, each week in that kind of efficient style, uh, I think it uniquely adheres to Well, it. it's it's efficient, but what you're describing, if you're if you're making a pass to the movie every four and a half days and having screenings, you're also working really fast. You know, you're not you're not spending an entire week <laughs> on a reel. So um, I, I I almost feel like that kind of that kind of energy gets into the track as well, right? To some degree, you certainly keep a big picture perspective on it, which is nice, but, and and I want to make sure that, I, that I'm clear, there are, during that week, we will focus on a certain scene or a certain act, you know, that needs more work than the other ones. And it is a progression through the six-week final. And that progression actually begins at the first temp. You know, the first temp, those first, whatever it is we do, seven days, eight days, whatever it is scheduled as, is indeed a very broad stroke, but we knock out the big picture concepts, we're building that foundation. And by the time we finish that first temp, we kind of know the direction that we're headed in. And you guys would agree with me, right? Yes. yes. I mean, there was a lot of scenes that Chris had seen that we went through that he didn't want to touch because he liked the rawness to some of the the mixing that we were doing within that. So there was, there were sections of the movie that says, no, absolutely perfect. Do not go into that area. And, you know, he warned us over and over <laughs> like exactly what he had heard. There are, like Eric was saying, there are areas that we would go in and we could actually go through and polish. And as the music tracks, as, as uh, Alex would, you know, they would come back and experiment with other tracks added in, that would trigger the balances of the other stuff. So we would have to take scenes and redo scenes. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, uh, uh, Chris and everybody on board, knew that. Yeah. Well, I wanted to, uh, you know, uh, Mark has been so patient sitting, <laughs> sitting here. <laughs> um, so we touched a little bit on the production tracks, uh, and, and obviously, you know, your job, your job is to, in, in some ways is one of the hardest ones. You're, you're on the set when the cameras are rolling, capturing dialogue and, and production, uh, soundtrack that then goes to Richard King's team to edit and then ends up in Gary Rizzo's hands for mixing. But, <clears throat> excuse me, tell us a little bit about the process of being on Chris Nolan's set and, and gathering sound. I can imagine this was, this movie was particularly challenging for you. It was. I mean, this is honestly probably the hardest movie I ever did. It was, uh, it was mostly the elements, the, the rain and the water, the salt water, the boats, Always like we spent so much time on the water. I think it was like downstairs on the moonstone for like 40 days, like out on the water. I mean, wow. just, you know, thankfully I don't get seasick. It turns out I didn't know, but, um, it's, I think the thing about Chris is like, he wants everything to be real. He wants to shoot in the place where the thing happened. He wants to shoot with real boats. He doesn't want to CG stuff. He doesn't want to do green screen. So, you know, the hardest thing is just whatever elements are in the real environment in this case, especially wind, there's tons of wind. Cause even, uh, just on the beach at Dunkirk, there's kind of a steady 30 mile an hour wind all the time. Mm -hmm. When I went on the scouts, I was like, okay, the wind is going to be the biggest issue here. And then it turned out salt water also a big issue because <laughs> uh, we'd go out on the mole and the waves would hit the mole and it just come like right over your head. And it's like, just protecting all the gear. I, everything was over the shoulder pretty much too, because 
couldn't use cards, had to carry everything everywhere. Wow. But, um, you know, and then whatever the conditions are, you just try and get the best sound you can. So that was, uh, it was challenging at times. So normally the, you know, the, the, the sound editors would, you know, would, would ask for the production sound mixer to try to gather as much, you know, location stuff as, as possible. But I can imagine with everything that was going on in this movie, and especially once you get, you know, once you get into the, um, into the fighter, uh, planes with the two guys, um, I, you must've been just focused on trying to get clean dialogue, right? You know, everything <laughs> else, everything else must've gone out the window, right? Yeah, I mean, to a certain extent, but I did, I actually did extensive sound uh, effects recording. Like I went to pretty much every boat. Some of the boats didn't actually work. They were towed in position, but all the boats that had motors that were kind of principal boats, I recorded all of those. I did, uh, in the beginning, I was trying to do, um, Hans had asked me to find whatever elements he thought he might be able to incorporate into the music. So we spent a lot of time like recording their boots walking in the sand or their boots walking on the street. Um, and, uh, like the wind and the rigging of like boats in the Harbor and stuff like that. And, uh, like we, we tried to focus on wind and, and feet and, um, and boat motors, but, uh, and I gave all of that to Hans and I don't know what, you know, if he used any of it or all of it or who knows, you know, I, I don't know, but, um, in there somewhere, yeah, <laughs> some, somewhere <laughs> yeah, Hans would have stolen it. <laughs> And um, and then I gave a little zoom recorder to the Spitfire pilots that we put inside of the planes. We try to get the, the sound of the Spitfires, but it was it didn't sound great. And uh, Richard did an amazing job recording like the planes. Tell spikes. me about tell me about the dialogue in the Spitfires with the with the fighter pilots. Um, I mean, I would presume that that was all ADR. No, it was all real. And um, but it was the planes weren't flying during that. That actually they were on a gimbal on the ground. We shot at Palos Verdes with the water and the sky behind it. So, and Chris was actually manipulating the gimbal the whole time. <laughs> it <was> great. <laughs> um, but uh, he, you know, he insisted that we put mics in the masks, which we did. And uh, he, I asked him, I said, "Can we just do a wild track with the mask like cracked open or something?" He's like, "Nope." So oh, all yeah. the dialogue. Was, oh, 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 oh. And I tested a lot of different mics inside the mask. I tried like, uh, you know, all these different brands of lavaliers and. Uh, I kind of settled on one I thought was the best. And then the first day we started shooting, uh, one of the, not, um, one of the actors was really yelling into the mask and I didn't like the way it sounded. Mm -hmm. And I said to Chris, I don't, I want to change the mic. I don't like the way it sounds. He says, but you tested all these microphones. I said, yeah, but nobody was yelling in the mask like that. You know, people were talking to each other. This guy was yelling. So anyway, we ended up switching mics and taking a few minutes to do that. I, Whatever. I, I wouldn't say that I was happy with the sound in the mask, but I think that it was about the best that could be done in that situation. Oh, I, uh, you guys can't see him, but Gary Rizzo is just sitting here smiling, shaking his head. <laughs> I, I, I got to interject in this. Uh, I mean, to Mark's defense on this one, trying to capture the sound of that, uh, you have an IMAX camera that sounds like a Briggs and Stratton motor running there constantly <laughs> next to that microphone. And to the dialogue editing department that found alternate takes and snips and working and Gary with his magic, I'm not going to let his, you know, he, he pulled a rabbit out of his hat with this <laughs> because Chris does not like any uh, sound manipulation of the dialogue. He's very keen on don't do this, don't do that. So Gary had to weave a real tightrope stand on top of this thing and say, okay, I can do this and not destroy part of the dialogue. So it was a dance to get those tracks into that movie where you're not aware of this Briggs and Stratton motor going, yada, 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 you know, behind everything, you know, to both to the dialogue, you know, production capture on that, that had enough signal to noise ratio that was able to, in a dub stage to manipulate it further from there. To be fair, um, Chris did provide those tracks to me before we got into the first temp because he. Oh, knew, so you were able to spend some time with that? And yeah, to... he gives me a, he gave me in this particular case some offline time to try and clean those up. But I think that was um, so that when they were in the cutting room and they were building so that they the could track, cut. that they could actually do some cutting against that. So I heard I heard those tracks way before I saw the picture. And then, of course, once I saw the picture and I saw the context, because context is everything. I'm sure the first um, time you heard it. Then it was like, uh, then there was a whole nother level of attack of, oh my yeah. God, we're in close up on this. I got to go further. I got to, you know, it's, um, 
it was it was it was a challenge and i know what mark was up against and <laughs> you know i know what hoita the dp was up against and you know we're all trying to do the best job that we possibly can do and you know we're trying to come through for chris we're trying to listen to the things that are really important to him which really is authenticity don't inauthenticate any of this <laughs> because you lose the honesty of it and he is all about those two things honesty and authenticity that's so true very true well i wanted to ask you guys about this because um you know obviously it, it wouldn't be a christopher nolan film if there wasn't a little controversy about the sound um, <laughs> Did we did we make it too loud? I, I, so you know I, you know that's it's I, I always it's it's I, I'm always tickled by these conversations about you know the the you know the questions about the dialogue intelligibility for Bane or you know in, in Interstellar or you know questions about the noise level and and uh, and Dunkirk. But I what I wanted to kind of open up to you guys uh, in terms of a question is it feels like Chris Nolan as a storyteller is just using sound in a fundamentally different way than most filmmakers are. So can you talk about a little bit about that and maybe why that manifests in some differences in the track than, than maybe the audience is used to hearing? Yeah, I would say that, you know, Chris is, um, if you go to the opera, you do not understand every single word of that operatic singing. Right. You, do, you enjoy it as an overall element and is moved by that overall element. Yes, you are. We have become such a spoon-fed society with dialogue, 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 got to understand, got to read lips. And I think people become lip readers because that's what they're focused on, not the idea of stepping back and saying, what do I get from this? If a person walks into a room uh, and holds a gun up, you know, something's going to happen. Right, right. You don't have to say, I have a gun and I'm going to hold it on you. Story is told by the picture. So... Chris's ways is I think it's more of a art form of saying, let the audience kind of decide and make up their mind with a scene. Right. Because Chris has said over and over and over, because there's a lot of times that we don't understand certain things of why we're doing certain things. But he says at the end of it, he says, did you understand that scene? Well, yeah, the moonstone help these guys out of the oil slick. Right. You don't have to understand every single word of that scene. You understand that there's a rescue going on and they're pulling guys on board. Right. So the understanding of the scene is Chris's intent. Let your audience develop their own timeline of that understanding. Let it unfold. Yeah. It, it unfolds at different rates too. Some yeah. people, man, they get it right off the bat when you know something's going on. They don't need to hear the dialogue. Other people, it's like, oh, my God, what they say? And then they start worrying about what they thought they missed. Well, that really doesn't have anything to do with the scene you're watching. So that's where I'm coming from with it. It's funny because with Interstellar, which had the big controversy about the music kind of overriding the dialogue, when I saw it, the first time I saw it, I thought it, it didn't bother me. I'm like, I understood the movie. I knew what was happening. I knew that the that he, McConaughey was leaving and his kid was hugging him and they were saying something like you know I love you I'm, I'm sorry I'll never see you again but I couldn't hear it but I knew that right and um and then I watched the movie a couple more times when the whole controversy happened and I thought I don't I don't see the controversy I understand the movie mm -hmm. like it's my, I recorded the dialogue that's being obliterated in parts by the music but it doesn't bother me mm -hmm. why is it bothering all these other people. <laughs> <laughs> It's a song lyric to some degree, you know, for Chris. You don't always understand every lyric of every song you hear on the radio, but you understand the emotional content of that song. And, and these are Chris's songs. And fortunately, he lets us, you know, contribute to them. Uh, it's it, 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 everything is evaluated for its emotional content as it goes into the mix even that dialogue I, I mean i know i'm echoing back to what i said earlier but the dialogue has a pace and a pulse and a purpose in our mix and it sits exactly where he orchestrates it to be and it works to his uh, uh to in his perspective it is complementing all of the elements all together and for him it is one thread that carries you all the way through whether you understand every bit of it or not you feel something from it uh, and i do think that sound does kind of have um through the ages it does have a style to it and yes chris's movies maybe don't match the normal style of movie soundtracks that come out today but isn't that what makes it kind of special 
Isn't that what makes it unique? Isn't that what makes it maybe stand out? Um, and some people will say, well, you know, it stands out because we don't like it. Well, that's your perspective of it. But the fact of the matter is that we take risks and we do things for um, for their, uh, for in the moment what feels like the right thing to do. And not just because, well, this is what everybody's doing. We're doing something that feels right emotionally in the moment. You know, and the other complexity about this particular film is that you've got authentic accents from all over England in, you know, in the production track and, and, and some French and, and some French and, and, some and there's and, French and, and Belgium yeah. and, you know, it's yeah. all over and yeah, not everybody is fully aware of the depth of those accents. And so I think that's actually one of the bigger challenges, uh, to this track is like, it's more of a culture and worldly perspective than it is a technical perspective. I gotta say none of, none of this really is a technical perspective it's all either a culture or an emotional perspective that we're talking about so people talked about the loudness of, of Dunkirk but I also thought that there was some really beautiful very subtle uh, quiet moments uh, in the film there's a lot of dynamic range in the track and the, 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 the dynamic when some of the loud scenes which was the stupid dives we worked extensively on the stupid dives Richard probably has you know gone more extensively into that but that was one element we came back to that Chris was constantly having us search our memory banks to come up with something that is so primeval and so loud and so aggressive that it puts the hair on the on your back to sit there and go, oh my God, here comes this thing again. He wants the audience to feel that too. And that's where the dynamics come in is he want that like, oh no. Just like everybody on that beach, you got 300,000 plus people doing the same thing, ducking. So they're aware that the, that sound is a special, big, big moment. And there are all the subtlety moments of, you know, riding on the train with the music just nice and soft, or out on the beach with the lonely beach. I mean, they have the heart and soul of that music sweeping that lonely beach scene where the, the, the guys are giving up. They're trying to get into the water with the boats and... Uh, all the sound effects and production tracks are all subservient to all that and just very underlaying with this tonality. Uh, so, yeah, that's where the dynamic come in is he's playing with your audience's emotions and sensory perception to it. So when it gets loud, it's intended to get loud. It's not to be obnoxious. It's the t intent to have you start to duck, cringe. And then it'll release off of you. It is you couldn't keep it up for seventy or ninety minutes, but yeah. there are scenes that he wants to hold you down, just pressure well, down. Well, yeah, and and part of the you know um, Richard King when we talked with him, he had he said something I thought was really powerful. He said my my job in making the track is to express what the characters are hearing, and that's exactly what you're talking about, Greg. Like that was a deafening experience for those people on that beach, and so it's entirely appropriate that it should be very loud. Yeah, I mean, when you have a bomb or mortar or whatever that's hitting the mole going off next to you, it's not supposed to be something that's subtle. It's supposed to be something, like, oh, my God, that just happened. I don't want to be near this, but I'm jammed here on the mole. But also don't kid yourself in that. The, the dynamic range um, is there to allow you to breathe, but the rhythm of this film is constantly controlling the rate that your heart is beating, even through the quiet moments. That is absolutely intentional, even when it does get quiet. Yes, when we do get big, it is to put you on that beach and put those guys on that beach and, and bring back uh, the reality of that. But even in the quiet moments, it is, a, it is fully orchestrated. It is so intentional that even though you may be taking... Uh, uh, deeper, slower breaths, but your heart rate is absolutely being controlled by the maestro, Mr. Nolan. Well, yeah, I was thinking about, uh, you know, the, the, one of the moments I, I loved was, you know, when the, when the guys are, are, they're kind of hiding in the boat uh, right before the, you know, they start shooting holes through the, uh, through the hull. And, you know, it's, you're, as you say, Chris Nolan is taking you on a journey with this, with the, with the film and with the track. Yeah, he makes me think safe within that boat all of a sudden now they're safe right That's and all of a sudden their safety now is interrupted by this explosive shell even though it's a piece of lead but the sound that we push for that to make the dynamic range the soft to the extreme loud of it it's like 
oh my god we're not safe this this is going right through this hall and that's yeah. the trickery to dynamics of a movie is lean your audience in i mean over films and films you lean your audience in for things are quiet so they become comfortable at watching the screen so they're not their ears are open so it's like your your irises open up on your eyes your ears open up so by the time you think you're hearing all the little subtlety of the water and the guy is talking inside the boat, then you slam it with a, you know, that gunshot through the hall. And now your ears clamp down uh, because you think that's the loudest thing you've heard. I have to say that um, another element, in my opinion, that made this mix unique from all the other Chris Nolan mixes that I've participated on is um, the use of the loop group. I know it sounds crazy hmm. to say, wow, the loop group, really, Rizzo? Um, the the <laughs> fact of the matter is we used more loop group in this film, I think, than any of the others. And and it's easy to say, well, you used it because of the numbers of, of troops Extras that are on the beach. But, beach but, but it also was used as uh, as a as a tool, as a, as a device, certainly when um, the the boat is sinking and the guys are drowning and it's, it's helping to sell the number of people surrounding our right. lead characters and to increase the peril. And to, it was a device that we have rarely used before on any of the other Nolan mixes. And we had, oh gosh, I'm trying to remember how many tracks we had, but more than ever. Uh, and loop group is always a little tricky because Chris is always a, up for the sure. authenticity of it. And this is, you know, studio <laughs> actors brought in to recreate mm -hmm. a group of people. So definitely one of the trickier things from my perspective that was used a lot in this film. Did Chris direct the uh, loop group sessions? Was he there? Um, you know, Dave Bach actually directed a lot of those. Mm. Um, and he's a oh, tremendous, yeah, yeah, he's yeah. tremendous yeah. Uh, and, a, and a good friend. Um, I don't believe that Chris was actually yeah. there, but it, um, but of course he approved all the tracks sure. before they got cut in. And and, and and everything, everything gets his uh, his stamp before it goes in. So that was part one of our conversation with the uh, Oscar-nominated team on Dunkirk. And part two, uh, we're going to talk with supervising sound editor Richard King. And this is actually part of an interview that we did with Richard last summer. We sat down and spoke with him about his long-term collaboration with Christopher Nolan. And at that point, Dunkirk had just been released in the theaters, and so we spent quite a bit of time talking about it. And so uh, here's some excerpts from that part of the conversation. I'm curious to hear kind of what the process is of collaborating you know, with, with Chris on, on one of his films. What At what point do you tend to get involved? Do you read the script before he goes out and shoots? Do you have conversations with him about it? Um, <clears throat> and how does the, are you involved during production? And how does the post-production workflow, uh, workflow go? Um, I, I usually uh, am uh, invited to read the script before they start shooting. Um, and sometimes there's time for us to have a, a, a short chat before they go off and shoot, sometimes not. Mm -hmm. on, uh, on Dunkirk, we were able to have a short conversation before they left. Um, uh, I mean, my I tend to respond more to uh, images than to the written word as far as coming up with sound ideas. Mm -hmm. um, it's very abstract reading a script for me, and, sure. and 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 obviously can be can be interpreted by the director when shooting and cutting together in so many different ways that it's it's uh, it's for me anyway. It's a little bit of a the, the script is simply a kind of a rough roadmap of what's what's coming in the future well i i imagine i'm sorry to i, I imagine for for on one of chris's movies too because obviously he's writing for himself to direct so it may it may be you know a little bit more sparse than you would normally see in a in a, in a film script coming in i no i i mean he he he's 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 spelling everything out he, mm. he's obviously <clears throat> writing the script not only as a shooting script but as a script for the studio the to read heads and, and the, yeah, everybody right, yeah. to read. So it, it's, it's got to be a, it, it's always a, it's always a very good, uh, a very good roadmap. I think it's just my psychology is such that I respond, uh, I, son uh, I, I, I sonically respond more to images than to, than to, uh, than to uh, reading and imagining what those images are going to look like. Right. Um, uh, so what might be that conversation that you would have with him before he would go shoot? Uh, uh, if, if, he, if he's already thinking about specific things that he knows are going to be important, 
he'll mention those to me. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and uh, ask me to start thinking about them. And um, um, for instance, in Dunkirk, it was the Stuka sirens that we knew were going to be an important um, part of the audio story. So for the <clears throat> so for the the two or three people who won't have seen the film <laughs> by the time we the, the, when they hear this conversation, the Stuka. So you're talking about the the German dive bomber planes that are are coming in and 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 strafing the beach, and they have a they have a weird they actually they have a a sound generating siren that's part yeah, of the structure a, of the plane? Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a device that, uh, that they cooked up uh, before the war and uh, they're, they're sirens, we can do a cutaway of them later there. They're, yeah. they're, they're sirens that are affixed to the wheel struts and they're, they're wind operated, so the propeller on the front of them, about this big, about a meter, and, uh, and uh, they, uh, it's a very elaborate system with a brake so that when they're flying to the to the uh, to the field to the uh, uh, operation you know area, uh, it's engaged so it's not spinning. When the plane begins to dive and it dives almost vertically, uh, they release this brake and the propeller starts to spin. And it starts to emit this howl. And uh, there's also and this, was, this, this served no purpose other than psychological. Oh, it terror. was a psychological terror weapon, and and they they did it. Uh, uh, probably less for the troops, as much as the um, the uh, fleeing refugees, and uh, you know, it basically would stop everybody on the road. It would also freak out horses. In those sure. days, oh, there was a lot of horse-drawn uh, stuff in in the military. Uh, you know, the, the, they were still using horses, so it it would uh, it would um, terrorize the horses and and uh, basically just uh, uh, you know freak out anybody on the <laughs> ground. And it was a very apparently a very very loud sound, um, but it but it became more of like the calling card for the Stuka. So once the soldiers became accustomed to this sound, they, they uh, the, the pilots, German pilots, uh, wanted to stop using them because they right. felt like it was giving them away. Sure. And these are already slow, unmaneuverable planes <clears throat> that had these to are be- not, These are not fighter jets. These are not yeah. fighters and they had to be, generally have a fighter escort because they were slow and they were targets for the RAF. <clears throat> so they stopped using them by the Battle of Britain, which was just a few months after I see. Dunkirk. Oh, interesting. So very, that's something very, that's very short lived. It's very kind of specific to the sound of Dunkirk. These, Dun these sirens. And that part, that very, very early part of the invasion of France and and Holland and, and Dunkirk in the very beginning of the war. And um, and uh, and in researching this story, it became really fascinating because there's no Stukas left in the world that fly. There's no uh, none of these sirens left. Nobody had these boxes left anymore no, yeah. that I could find. Uh -huh. Because the, the other thing is they were very short lived. So they were only right. on the planes for a, a couple of years, right, the, right, right. you know, pre war and beginning of the war, and um, the Allies destroyed all of. Presumably, the I was about to say, presumably plans. those planes were destroyed. Right? They yeah, destroyed yeah. everything. The, 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 they wanted to reduce uh, uh, Germany's uh, mischief making. Uh, uh, abilities for a yeah. long time, so they, they, um, all that stuff was was is gone, right. and and I scoured all the German historical archives and wherever I could look, and basically there's just not much information about them, not even about how they're built, the sirens, I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so I, um, uh, you know, we have these historical recordings that everyone's heard and that had been used in TV and movies for. Decades, and what are those? Are those just that, sort of could come out of like BBC archives, or no? They, I think they were recorded by German newsreel crews before uh, the war, okay. and they were, they were. Uh, if you listen to all of these, if you can go on YouTube and find dozens of examples, um, it seems to be. It sounds to me it's that that they were from the same period in recording. That they were, um, if not done the same day or week, then certainly within the same year. And uh, probably according to the 
the, the German historical archives probably recorded on wax discs mm -hmm. in the field. Mm -hmm. Uh, so quality was was iffy to begin with. You're not getting super clean recordings of those things. You're getting yeah. super saturated recordings, which right. kind of may very well add something to the intensity of the sound. Right. And um, and I wanted I wanted to retain that intensity without uh, resorting to too much, you know, just raw distortion. Um, uh, but it. it it, it was clearly a very memorable sound to the to the men on the beach. Um, they uh, they allude to this sound a, a number of times right. in, in the historical uh, references. It must have just been terrorizing. Yeah. It was it was uh, it was because you it, it, it was um, it, it, the, the siren would actually be louder than the engine itself, hmm. and just this screaming thing coming straight down from the sky. And you guys use that really effectively in the film. There are a couple of, of instances that, that I remember from my viewing of the film where the, it, I, and I may be misremembering it, but my impression was the track drops to very, this, things become very quiet. And then this screaming starts in a very specific point that it just gets louder and louder and louder. And it just, you, you just the anxiety level starts to build for you. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, um, it was it was it was a, a long, interesting, quite fascinating process uh, to come up with that sound and to and to and to um, and to have it evolve from the kind of this beginning distant mm -hmm. howl that slowly becomes a scream that slowly just becomes this ear piercing, almost animalistic. Yeah. Uh, um, so, you know. without asking you to give away the secret sauce, how did you create the sound? Um, well, we I built the siren. I, I, I got an air raid siren and put it inside a steel drum, and uh, we rigged it up, took it out in the desert, and fired it up. And that was sort of the pure, the I would say in quotes, the pure component of mm -hmm. the of the of the sound. Um, uh, and it probably was not far from what they originally sounded like because they were simply air raid sirens, right. uh, you know, and and mounted um, onto the onto the plane. Right. Yeah. I, I think the, the the Stukas had enormous dive brakes too that opened up when they dove to regulate the speed of fall. Hmm. Uh, I'm sure they added something to the sound, but most of it was the was the sirens themselves. Um, uh, and then, and then we just started experimenting with how to amp that up and how to make that more, uh, less literal and more, uh, um, uh, you know, it, it, it just, it just had to, had to say terror right. and, um, and, and unstoppable terror. Right. You know, there were very few anti-aircraft guns on the beach. They really didn't have much of a defense against these things. Yeah. The ships had some defense, but they were... and the ships could actually, the, the faster ships could actually uh, weave and, and, and move out of the way of the planes once they had committed to their dive. Because once they because committed the, to the dive... Well, because the planes were that slow. They couldn't, well, they, <laughs> once they had committed to their dive, and they were diving fairly fast, they couldn't, like, shift to the right or the left. <laughs> they were committed, uh -huh. and they were going so fast that the plane actually had a had a had a uh, a self um a self uh correcting uh device on board which in case the pilot blacked out during the real during the dive. term really yeah that the plane would pull out and huh. and fly off into a certain direction which became uh, their achilles heel because the the, the people on the ground began to realize, ah, we know which way he's, that plane's going to go when he pulls out of his dive, and that's where we're going to fire. Mm. So, um, uh, so they could aim for that. Yeah. So, um, uh, but the, the, uh, the siren was something that was mentioned a lot in the, in the you know, historical references, and, and we knew it would be very important. So that was one thing he mentioned when we first talked about Dunkirk. Um, uh, he and he just I had read the script. He just gave me kind of a a brief you know rundown of the things he was thinking and um, uh, um, of course a lot of that we moved on from later 
it was it was a constant evolution and i don't think uh, i i think chris's uh, uh genius is that he's he never stops searching and looking right it's not a it's not a fixed the script is not a fixed uh a fixed uh version of what the film's going to be it's a it's a blueprint which he's exploring which one deviates from as one learns the, the you know learns the film yeah. and the, and as the film is being discovered and yeah. So what's um, what's the editorial process like? So they, they go they go off and they shoot. At what point do you um, really start working with the film? And are you are you giving sound effects to Lee during the, the during the editing process, or how does that how does that collaboration really work out? Yeah, I, I start giving giving Lee uh, sounds pretty early, and um, and usually start on Chris's films about the time they stop shooting, roughly. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> At that point, I've um, I've given Lee. I've I've been able to make some some sounds for the film, recorded some sounds for the film. Uh, I've gotten out of the way the things that I can get out of the way if I know that there are certain weapons or certain vehicles or certain planes or whatever. I'm um, I've tried to get those recorded early, so I'm I'm ready with a with a you know they're coming a well library right. of material yeah. that I I know we'll need. And um, uh, and then as they are gearing up for the director's cut screening to the studio, we do a very elaborate temp mix, which is a, kind of the audio blueprint for what we're going to do. It's at least it's the uh, blueprint's the wrong word. It's like the it's like the it's like the uh, um, like the proof of concept maybe or something. Yeah, like it's, that. Like yeah. The, it's like the it's like it's like it's like. Yeah, this is going to work. Now we're going to make it a hundred times better. Yeah. But at least we know that we have, uh, we have, um, you know, we, we we're all on board with the same idea, and we we know what we're doing, and we know, yeah, this is going to work, and um, and so I start working uh, with picture, um, you know, shortly after they've stopped shooting, when Chris is ready to to let me see something. Um, start working with picture towards this tent mix for the studio screening, which is kind of the first time Chris gets the film up on its feet. And, right. And uh, and I, I I'm I'm presuming because of where Chris is in his career, um, he's not you know, he doesn't have to go out and do a lot of audience test screenings uh, for scores. But you you say he he shows the film to the studio. Um, you know, and are, are there other tent mixes that happen along in the in the process? Yeah, or is it, is it yeah. just kind of a rolling process of keeping things up to date? And yeah, yeah, we we do other tent mixes, and he does like to bring in um, audiences, and uh, he does his own friends and family screenings, and just kind of see how the film's playing. Yeah, he wants he wants to see yeah. what's not making sense to people, and and uh, which is probably anything. important with a film like Inception, right? <laughs> yeah, uh, I, yeah, he 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 wants to see how it's playing. Yeah. And and I think I also just as a filmmaker sitting in an audience, he can feel you feel the energy feel yeah feel how they're responding to the film and I, uh, um, you know he wants he wants to reach as wide an audience as, as he can. So do you guys when when that after Chris has finished shooting comes back he starts working with Lee, do you guys have a formal sort of spotting session and go through the film and he shares ideas with you or is it really sort of like you kind of start working on your own and send stuff back and forth and I'm, I'm kind of curious I mean what I'm really asking you is how does he talk to you about sound and about what he wants and about what he's thinking well sound is such a uh, an abstract sure thing I, I, you know uh, oh you can't say it's not red enough or make it more blue or it's it's uh, it's it's um, uh, we found that that uh, that it's good to have a starting point, and if I can begin sending them sounds, uh, we have a point of reference mm -hmm. that I can get feedback. And it's not an abstract thing. It's like, how is this working? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Then, 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 then there's a then there's a definite thing which he a sound which he can respond to. Right. And uh, and 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 comment upon that. So it's 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 really a matter of. I just start and start on the sequences that uh, you know. Sometimes he'll ask me to start on something specific, and and I'll uh, uh, or I'll just start working on what you know strikes me as being the most 
sure thing that jumps out at me first and um and then start sending he and lee sounds and uh and get his feedback like that so it's kind of a rolling spotting session that goes on for months till the <laughs> end of the mix so um, I'm kind of curious about how that uh, that process goes. So I mean, we're here in your sound design room at Warner Brothers. I'm looking around. Obviously, it's a 5.1 room, um, and you've got a Euphonics console here. So are you um, are you focus? Is would you say your area area focus is mostly on the on the sound effects and design? Yes. And then you have obviously dialogue editors. That and when you're first starting, you know working with Lee and Chris as the cut starting to come in is is how many people are on the crew is it pretty lean and mean at that point or yeah we we always have a pretty small crew uh on Dunkirk there were two sound effects editors uh, one dialogue editor one ADR editor one really? Foley editor one assistant that's amazing to me because I, I I gotta you know, I gotta tell you when you know I, I saw the movie for the first time and, and obviously it's it's much shorter than Chris's films normally I think the movie's what 70 76 78 minutes but there's so much detail in it and so much stuff going on. I thought this must have just been a massive amount of work for the sound team. Um, but it's more, you, like, more like 100 minutes, I think. Oh, is it? Okay. But, um, uh, yeah, but we did have a, a nice long schedule. Uh -huh. So we were able to, uh, and we worked very hard. And we, uh, we, I, in, in addition to the editors, I also had, I think there were six or seven sound effects recordists that recorded different things for me uh, and that was an ongoing ongoing process um, but there's there's a there's a tremendous advantage to working with you know the same people and right. a, a lot of these people uh, have worked with Chris before uh, the dialogue editor Hugo Wang has worked with on all of Chris's movies that I've done and knows his taste and knows what he likes and Chris really likes to maximize the production tracks and mine everything he can mm -hmm. from them mm -hmm. uh and hugo's very good at that um that must have been a, that must have been a particular challenge on dunkirk it was of... yeah it was but but even so there were only a few literally half a dozen loop lines at most really interesting almost no looping huh. so it was all um salvaged from from production recordings all, and, and all then takes and, and then gary of... rizzo did a wonderful job of right. cleaning up what he could with uh of the IMAX cameras and um, um, I mean it, it ultimately and and I'm I, I completely uh, I completely understand Chris's feelings about this and 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 I've kind of come to I'm come to the same feeling myself through working with them I think uh, it's just very hard to get ADR to stick to the screen mm -hmm. and because it just doesn't feel right. Well, it, it, there can be there's so many ways that can go go wrong, and 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 a lot of them in very subtle ways. But um, but uh, if I mean we just try everything we can to salvage that production recording because that's gold, and it's it's um, it's uh, you know that was what he shot, that was what he chose to use in the movie. And to have to loop it is almost like having to reshoot it. Right, so, right. so uh, <clears throat> um, you know, only in dire circumstances do we do any any looping at all. There's a lot of group and group ADR in sure. Dunkirk. Um, all the extras on the beaches in France were French <laughs> for the most part. So, uh, and and with the I think with the IMAX cameras, there wouldn't have been much to. Utilize anyway. Much to use anyway, right, yeah. So we uh, we got a great loop group in, in London and um, did did the vast majority of our loop grouping in London mm -hmm. um, with this loop group and did a, a small bit here. And then uh, you know obviously um, the, the the other huge part of the of the track in a Christopher Nolan a film is Hans Zimmer score. So one of the things that has been interesting to me because I've gone back in the last week or so and, and taken a fresh look at some of the films and and I've, I felt this to be especially true with Dunkirk is I'm often really not sure if what I'm hearing is music or sound design um, and I'm wondering what's the you know tell me a little bit about about the collaboration 
between you and Hans, or or are you gonna say I I, I we don't, we don't talk at all, and I, I hear the tracks for the first time when we show up on the mixing stage. I'm, I'm just but it, it, but they they fit so well organically together. It seems like there must be, you know, a certain degree of collaboration. Hans is the man. I I, I love <laughs> the guy, and 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 his approach to music. I, I, um, uh, I don't. I don't want to sound pretentious, but I, I feel like if that's kind of my approach to sound design, he he'll he'll use anything that he that he feels is appropriate. Mm -hmm. He'll use a shitty out of tune piano that he got out of a dump, uh -huh. or he'll use you know a big piece of metal and bang it, or he'll yeah. and 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 make music out of that. Right. And uh, and so nothing's off limits with him. And and every movie he does, he wants to. Push it and and make it better and make it different and like in other words never repeat. Sure. You know, what was it Picasso that said it's okay to copy from other people but never from yourself? <laughs> I, I I think I think he's uh, he's always looking to 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 try something new and to top himself and I yeah. I um, I admire that enormously and and you know uh, um, and uh, try to uh, try to. Do that in my own work. You know? Are you? Are you? So, so anyway, to, to, to yeah. answer your question about collaboration, um, t typically we we don't talk very much. Uh, um, typically, what happens is is we is he he's he's going full tilt on, in his arena, and I'm going full tilt in my arena. And you guys are both working at the same time. Yeah, uh, obviously. Um, yeah. In parallel tracks to each other. Right, and uh, uh, um, and. And generally, Chris likes to play the sound effects and the music. He doesn't, with some exceptions, he doesn't. He doesn't, you know, trade back and forth. There's not moments without sound effects and music. It is not. Oh, that's interesting. So, so there aren't really moments where one steps forward. And the other generally, steps I mean, back. certainly in Dunkirk, that was that's the case. The, some of his other films, there have been moments wh where one has taken the lead over the other in a strong mm -hmm. fashion, um, but. Uh, uh, you know, Han, Hans is making the sounds that the audiences hear. I'm making the sounds that the characters hear. So oh, I'm, I'm creating the world. I find I, 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 I think of it as I'm creating the world that the characters are inhabiting. And that's the fun for me, which is to get to inhabit that world with those characters. And, you know, when I'm working on a scene, I'll, I'll, that's, what, that's what allows me to feel like I'm that guy running through the sand, feeling the crunch of sand under my feet, and or being in a Spitfire cockpit. I I I keep working on it until I feel like, uh, yeah, I can feel that I'm there now. So but, you're you're using sound design al almost to create the POV of the characters in, in, in that sense. Yeah, I think that's that's kind of how I look at it, and and um, it's it's kind of it's my way to, to voyeuristically. Participate in the movie and be there with the characters, and and I would come in to work every day. I, I started working on this right, not well. We were working on it through the election and so on, but I just became so discouraged after the after the election, coming in here and being in 1940 all day, like climbing into a, a Spitfire <laughs> cockpit, putting on my harness. You're like the outside my, world. My leather. The uh, outside world is too terrible. And, I mean, and, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go to World War II just, for a while. I just had. Yeah, believe it or not, it was an improvement. <laughs> and I, uh, I, uh, I, um, I just, I felt such a connection to this movie that I haven't felt in in a long time. Yeah. I, uh, uh, because I think this historical material was presented so accurately and emotionally and 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 uh, and viscerally and and Chris he really wanted to make a, a he, he didn't want to be namby pamby about it he wanted to present war and all its mm -hmm. horror and 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 senseless crazy brutality. Um, and uh, and just make it as as profound and you know and and strong an experience for as, as the as the audience as possible. And he and he you know it, it, he milked music and sound effects for every bit of energy and and emotion and and uh, um, and also we started seeing these images that 
they were bringing back and Lee was cutting together and it was so staggering that mm -hmm. without any visual effects, it's right. all in camera stuff yeah. with these large format cameras and the images were just staggering and so inspiring and we, we, we really had to work hard to live up to those images sure. and to try and to try to uh, try to uh, uh, you know make the Spitfire sound as good as they look. Right, right, right. I'm, I'm curious uh, to talk a little bit more about Hans Zimmer and the music. So, um, are you are you getting any kind of sketches or hint of what he's up to while you're building? Um, or are you really hearing that stuff for the first time on the mixing stage? No, I, I hear it uh, throughout and he hears what I'm doing okay. throughout. The, and, and the beauty of how Chris works is that by the time of that first temp mix, whatever visual effects are in the movie are, are there. And they're generally pretty complete. Mm -hmm. There's not a lot of stuff trickling in late. Uh, we're hearing the score. There's not, never a temp score. We're hearing Hans's music from the get-go mm -hmm. and um and so you guys may not be having <clears throat> you guys may not be having you know conversations we're, and saying like i'm going to take this dynamic this frequency range you take this frequency range but you're hearing each other's stuff and yeah. reacting to it and responding exactly to it. yes exactly okay and 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 taking chris's direction on uh on you know ah uh, i'll see ah he wants to do this musically in this in this section then I'll do this right and and um, uh, so so while there's no uh, I think it's almost better actually for Hans and I not not to not to uh, divvy stuff up not to um, <laughs> what was I gonna say conspire with each other right. to uh, you know to, to, to divide the track up it's it's I, I think it's much better for us to for both of us to give it our all from the head pop to the tail pop and then, uh, and then you may have to make some difficult and then decisions sorts, on the dot, and then stage, sort right? it out later, because because yeah. because uh, uh, um, uh, what it generally involves is reducing uh, one or two elements in the sound effects, or reducing a couple of elements in the music. It's not generally not a wholesale, right. you know, uh, replacement or sure, sure. It's, so it's it's just a like it a ends tuning, up being a hybrid a of the, yeah. And how involved? Um, is Chris during the mix? What's his profile? Because I've certainly, you know, I, you know, I think you and I have both worked with directors that, you know, just show up for a playback and give notes and leave. And then we've also worked with directors who have to be there for the pre-dubs and you, you see all the different flavors of everything in between. So what, what, what is Chris's kind of, how, what's his profile during the mix? He's there every day, all day. Pre-dubs and final? We don't pre-dub. The only, the uh -huh. only pre-dubbing we do I do in here with sound effects because it's just it would be too uh, too much material to try to sort through. So on the there's stage. no dialogue pre-dubs. There's no dialogue pre-dubs. Gary, Gary, uh, Gary, um, Gary does it on the fly, and and when needed, Chris gives him time to dig into something and work in a section. Really? Uh, so you, you guys, it's final from day one. And... Final from day one. And final actually from the first day of the first tent mix. I see. Uh, yeah. And and that's when. That's when we all probably have it the hardest because Gary's uh, scrambling to make the dialogue audible above all the racket that Hans and I are producing and uh, cleaning up camera noise and. Um, well, that first time you play the reel bag must be a, a, a sobering moment. <laughs> well, you know, it's generally not as bad as you think. It, it, I, I think we've all we've all um, we've all. Um, worked really hard to get into that spot and we know that this first tent mix is important and uh, uh, it's it's intense but it's it's you know a, a, and, and as I think a lot of films uh, are doing now we we take that first temp dub and then the next time we come back to do a tent mix we're, we start from that end point right so right. it's a rolling situation sure. and then when we situation. start the final uh, which is usually about six weeks uh, we um, we begin from that, so we we're already beginning right. at a pretty good place. Sure. Where we know it sounds really good and it's working. And, and, and okay, and now what can we, what can we rethink? What and can we also really importantly, Chris is not hearing things for the first time at that 
at that stage. So there's no, you know, I think we've all had that experience where, you know, temp stuff the director falls in love with and then you show up on the final mix stage with new tracks that they're- Chris is really not like that. He, yeah. he'll, 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 he will go for what's best. Right. And I've seen him throw things away that he's lived with for months mm -hmm. uh, because something is brought in that's better. Yeah. Uh, um, but if what's in the temp tracks is the best thing and it's really working, then we stick with that. Sure. Um, but he's very he, he he's very in the moment in making the movie and very uh, and responding to the film in the moment and quite uh, remarkably able to um, to put all the preconceptions out of his mind and at least that's my perception of, of yeah, him yeah he, he, and and just experience in the moment and uh, and um, uh, you know it comes up with with fabulous off the wall ideas that yeah. uh, because of that. Richard, it's been fantastic talking with you today. It's been fun, Glenn. Um, do, do you, uh, before we wrap up, is there anybody you want to give a shout out to? Your normal, your, your, who's on your team? Your Foley oh, artists, yeah. that sort of, that sort Everybody of thing. did such a great job on, on Dunkirk. Uh, uh, I got to say first, uh, my first assistant, Andrew Bach, is uh, amazing. You know, he's my right hand and he runs the show. And uh, he knows film, he knows digital. Uh, he can fix computers. He <laughs> understands the relationships between film and uh, because we're working in the film world a lot with Chris's films. Yeah. Um, so he's he's uh, invaluable. Uh, 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 Michael Mitchell and uh, Randy Torres were the sound effects editors. Mm -hmm. um, did amazing work. Worked their asses off. Um, Michael Dressel was the uh, supervising Foley editor. Hugo Wang, I mentioned earlier, uh, amazingly talented, careful uh, dialogue work. Um, just, uh, you know, just can't say enough good things about Hugo. Um, and uh, Dave Bach and Russ Farmarco kind of divided the, Dave had to leave halfway through the show, mm -hmm. so they, they kind of divided the ADR uh, job, which was in this case mostly group. It was a lot yeah, of group, yeah. so they did that wonderfully. Um, and uh, 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 John Rush. Uh, oh, that hack! Yeah, that hack. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's give the, him another chance. Give him the try. Uh, he is the he's the only Foley artist that we've done a Dolby Institute podcast around. Well, so he, there you um, go. He he really he and his team really uh, really threw themselves into this and and uh, uh, you know had a whole bunch of sand delivered and. And for the beach, and and found the right that's props, great. and you know we had to get these hobnail boots because that's what the soldiers wore. What is a hobnail boot? It actually had like tacks stuck in the bottom, really, which seems completely impractical. But it, I, I think I think the idea was if they were marching on dirt or like a dirt road, it'd be fine because it'd give you some traction. But if you're walking on a street, it's like, you know, it's, it's like, like tap shoes. <laughs> yeah, and. Uh, yeah. So we they they made and found some hobnail boots and and um, he's very creative. Did a John really Rush. really yeah. good job with the foley, which was important in the show because there wasn't much not a lot of usable, dialogue. Yeah, well, there wasn't a lot of usable production because of the sure, cameras. Because of the cameras, yeah. Um, um, and of course, Gary Rizzo and Greg Landecker, right. the recording mixers, who right. uh, you know are are part of the family and and. Uh, uh, it was, it was uh, Greg's last uh, last film. He retired after Dunkirk. Is that true? Yeah. Goodness. After a storied career of yeah, decades, of yeah. uh, multiple. Well, what Academy a great Awards. movie to go out on. Yeah, he um, he uh, he's an amazing person, and uh, and did the dialogue, did, did the sound effects and music mix, and Gary Gary handled uh, handled dialogue, and everybody on the in the Warner Brothers facility here is, was terrific and knows the way Chris works and everyone just gets on board. And this has been your home for a long time. Yeah, and, yeah. and, and Chris has done almost all his mixes here. Right. Um, uh, so it's a very, very coherent, cohesive group yeah, of you people. really do have a family here. Yeah. Around that now. yeah. Well, again, thank you so much for taking the time and having this conversation. Um, that's, this is exactly why we wanted to do these podcasts was to do a deep dive conversation on some of this stuff and it's been really interesting and fun well good 
Before we wrap up, you know, obviously the uh, you know the the four of you and Richard King are are the the guys who are nominated for the Academy Awards. But more than just you worked on the film, so I wanted to give each of you a, a chance to give a, a shout out to some of your to some of your team members. Gary, do you want to? Well, I got to give a shout out to Hugo Wang, our dialogue editor, and Dave Bach, um, our ADR and group editor, and Russ Farmarco, who was also on that crew, and Tony Pilkington, our stage engineer, Unsung Song, our um, mix tech slash recordist slash cheerleader, um, Emma Lee Smith, our picture editor. Somebody else jump in. Oh, oh I was going to say, I mean, Lee Smith. Um, yeah, we go back to stage engineering. As stage engineers was Tony Pilkington, Ryan Murphy, which you know kept that stage running when all of a sudden you know you figure you got a ship that's going afloat here. You'll know, keep that ship running because we're on a schedule, on a mission with that. Unsun, which was our stage tech, you know, kept track of all of the stuff that we're laying down, where this version was, that version, this version. To Alex Gibson and his crew, Ryan uh, uh, Ryan Rubin is, you know, that that team there worked so hard. You cannot believe the amount of hours those guys had to put in on a daily basis to show up at 8.48 or 9 a.m. roll in the morning to have some fresh idea because Chris would go, go back and try it again. I want a different approach at this. And those guys really knocked it out of the park. So we got Richard King. We have uh, uh, Michael, his side uh, uh, sound effects editor. Uh, we have Andrew, which his stage tech does, you know, bring in the Pro Tools and all the files and keep those files up and running every day, opening them up on the stage. Uh, there was an intense, you know, crew that worked so cohesively and down to Kevin Collier, Tony Pilkington, everybody. That's one thing about Chris's films in this crew, because keeping the same crew, you keep the same group rate of everybody working together as one. Alex, what uh, from your side, who, who, uh, who's on your team? It was Ryan Rubin, just Ryan Rubin and myself. We had a lot of help from remote control as far as the uh, Alan Meyerson mixing it. Uh, there's some, help from Lauren Balf as the score producer. And that's about it. Our department's pretty small. Yeah. Um, Mark? Okay. Um, I didn't actually have any help. I did it all by myself. <laughs> you didn't have <laughs> boom, no boom man. You're the boom man too, huh? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, no, I have a fantastic boom operator. His name, I call him Huck. His name's Tom Caton. He's phenomenal. He was with me, uh, uh, he was uh, did all the Europe stuff, but in, when we came back to LA, we actually uh, well actually used uh, my friend Larry Commons because he's a scuba diver, and um, all the work was in the water. That was the, the scenes where um, like the torpedo came through the battleship wall and all that stuff. And these guys were literally in the water in scuba suits the entire time, and we used like a wireless boom, and they had to like hold it up like when they went under the uh, what are they called the the in the the bulkheads or whatever of the ship because the water would be almost touching and they have to squeeze the mic in there and get into the ship and then they could boom everything. And I did have some abandoned ship, abandoned ship, <laughs> seriously abandoned ship. And, um, so I had Tom Kate and I had this fantastic, uh, third in, um, in, um, the Netherlands named Dominic hop, H A P P E. I, I think you say hop, but, uh, he was amazing. In France, we had a, um, a third named Gautier Eisern. And in England, we had Tim. I mean, really, for me, like, I mean, the whole crew, This, to me, this is the most collaborative movie I think I've ever done because the situations were so difficult that we all had to support each other. And, um, I mean, Hoyta was amazing. He helped me so much. And he would hold that. Like, we had a blimp camera that was actually quiet. And he would actually have to hold that thing up. as heavier than the IMAX camera. Um, and Ryan, his grip, who helped him hold it, he was amazing. And um on the ship we had drew petrata the prop guy and myself there were only like there were only a few people on the on the moon, on the moonstone because a lot of times they were shooting from another boat but we drew and i were always on the moonstone and uh, and the actors and the captain of the ship anyway 
but it was it was an amazing experience and everybody like helped each other get through it because it was really tough for everybody well before we go i just want to tease greg uh landicker just a little bit um because <laughs> uh because I, I don't know if you can see behind him but over his shoulder he has put uh the two baftas i presume one of the one one of the baptas is well, four yeah, Baptists. That's the center. Three that's Baptists. The center one. So the, 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 the Dunkirk Baptist really is one in the center, and, and the three Academy Awards he's already won for uh, <laughs> mixing Speed and Raiders of the Lost Ark and Empire Strikes Back. So um, congratulations. Uh, but uh, thank, yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, I'll, I'll tease you a little bit, but uh, congratulations to all, uh, to all four of you guys. This is, a, a th- you, this is an amazing it's an amazing track and a, and a great achievement. And, and good luck at the, at the Dolby Theater on March 4th. Great. Thank, Thank you, you so much. very much. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You much. It's been a pleasure. So that wraps up parts one and two of our conversation on Dunkirk. Uh, this is Glenn Kaiser, director of the Dolby Institute, and this podcast is a co-production of the Dolby Institute and the Soundworks Collection. Thanks for listening.